Real pleasure to introduce uh, Alison Etheridge for the second talk of today. And she's going to talk about the branching broadening motion, mean curvature flow, and the motion of hybrid zones. Thank you, Alison. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say that Andreas told me that this subject would fit in perfectly with the afternoon before he knew what the subject was. So I can't help feeling that I'm an act of desperation in this seminar. Um, but here we go. <laughs> So the work, I, I'm also trying to do something incredibly clever involving two computers, so it's sure to go horribly wrong, as anyone who knows me will predict. This is work with Nick Freeman, who is at the University of Sheffield, and Sarah Pennington, who's in Bath. And it's motivated by some of the work that I've been doing for a couple of decades now, really, with Nick Barton in population genetics. So it's motivated by wanting to understand what happens to these things called hybrid zones. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go as far as I get to in this talk. And when I'm told to shut up, I'll stop um, because I have a suspicion there might be too much material. But um, let's see how it goes. So what's a hybrid zone? Well, a hybrid zone is a narrow geographic region which we see where two genetically distinct populations have come together and they can breed with one another. But the offspring are not as fit as the parents. And so the zone is a finite width. It, became, it remains bounded because the offspring are not terribly fit. And these are ubiquitous. We see them all over the place. And the particular example I'm showing you a picture of is one that Nick and his group have been working on for many years. They're anti-rhinum. So in English, we call them snapdragons. And we grow them in our backyard. But these are growing in the Pyrenees, near the border between Spain and France. And the hybrid zone consists on one side of the yellow flowers that you see on the yellow, in yellow at the bottom, and on the other side, the magenta colored flowers. And in between the two, we see these beautiful hybrids, but the hybrids don't, uh, don't spread. And a typical model for how such zones have arisen is that when we had our last glacial maximum in Europe, which was about 18,000 years ago, 18, 20,000 years ago, the plants that were living in Europe at the time retreated to refugia. And they were in those refugia for long enough that they became genetically distinct. But when the ice melted, they spread extremely rapidly. And when they came back together, they were not so genetically distinct that they couldn't interbreed. And what it is believed has happened with these antirhinum is that the reason that the hybrids are not as fit as the purebreds is that pollinators, so bees and other insects, are better at recognizing yellow flowers and pink flowers than at recognizing the beautiful flowers in between. But there are other things that can maintain hybrid zones as well. Um, they can be maintained because of a sharp change in the environment, for example. There might be a sharp change in soil type. And so one of the things we'd like to understand, if it's a change in soil type, that's not going to move very often, or at least only on, ge on geological timescales. Whereas if it's something to do with genetics, if it's because the um, populations are somehow pushed up against one another and interbreeding and the hybrids aren't so fit, then those hybrid zones might move around. And what we were motivated by was understanding how would those hybrid zones move. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a very, very simple mathematical model. You can see from the picture at the bottom that there are more than three different flower types. So you'll immediately see that my um, mathematical model is inadequate, but it's not very inadequate. It's reasonable to suppose that, that those flower types are determined by a rather small number of distinct mutations. So here's the model. Um, and believe me when I say it's easy to generalize, but you wouldn't want to see the notation. So in our model, we're going to suppose that every individual, so every, every plant, carries two copies of a particular gene. And those two copies can occur in two different types, one called little a and one called capital A. And A stands for allele. So if I say allele, it just means a type of the gene. And we're going to suppose that they're in what's called Hardy-Weinberg propor 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 yeah, proportions, so if the proportion of little a alleles, when I average over the population, is W bar, then that's because the proportion of plants that carry two little a alleles is W bar squared. One little a and one capital A is twice W bar, one minus W bar, and capital A, capital A, one minus W bar, all squared. So if a population is not in Hardy-Weinberg proportions, it doesn't take it very long to get into Hardy-Weinberg proportions under random mating. So this assumption is one which you can almost ignore. I mean, it's, very, it's really a very general setting. And what we're going to use to model the different fitnesses is what I'm going to call the relative fitness. So we're going to say that the purebreds, the little a, little a, and the capital A, capital A types have relative fitness one, but the hybrids, the heterozygotes, 
have relative fitness one minus s. Now that's a completely meaningless statement until I give you a model which explains what relative fitness does. So let's look at such a model. So what happens during reproduction in a population like this is that each plant produces an enormous number of what are called germ cells. And those germ cells carry the same genotype as, as the parent. So they'll carry two copies of each gene and they'll be the same as the parent. So if I have a little a capital A parent, then I'm going to produce little a capital A germ cells. Those germ cells will then split into gametes. So in humans, that's eggs and sperm. And a gamete will carry one copy of each gene. So a heterozygote produces a germ cell, which will be little a capital A, and that germ cell will split into one little a gamete and one capital A gamete. But in general gene reproduction, what's happening is an absolutely enormous number of germ cells are, reproduced, are, are being produced. And the relative fitness is just saying that the number of germ cells that a heterozygote produces, we're going to take to be one minus S times as many as those that a homozygote produces. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, let's suppose as we did on the previous slide that the proportion of little a alleles, so little a um, types across the population is W bar before reproduction. And let's see what happens during one round of reproduction. So what's that pool of gametes going to look like? Well, the proportion of little a after in the pool of gametes, I claim is going to be given by this ratio. So every, now let's see if we can do something clever. I almost used the wrong mouse. I told you I wouldn't manage with two computers. So if you, you can see my mouse moving, so that W bar squared there is saying that for every little a, little a homozygote, all of their germ cells, all of their gametes are going to be little a. So that gives me a W bar squared. For the heterozygotes, of which there are twice W bar, one minus W bar in my population, half of those gamete, half of the gametes are going to be little a and half are going to be capital A. So I'm just going to get W bar, one minus W bar. And then we see this term one minus S reflecting the fact that my heterozygotes don't produce quite as many ga uh, germ cells and consequently gametes as my homozygotes. And the infinity at the beginning is just um, to say, look, there are an awful lot of these things, okay? And then the bottom is normalizing factor. It's just saying what's the total number of gametes that produ are produced. So that's W bar squared for the little a, little a homozygotes, one minus W bar squared for the capital A, capital A homozygotes. And here are my heterozygotes in the middle. And again, there's a one minus S to indicate that the heterozygotes are not quite as fit as the homozygotes. And then cancelling those offending infinities, which I know as mathematicians you may not like, you see that we get this ratio here. Okay. So what does that say about the change in allele frequency between the pool of gametes and the parents? Well, we're going to expand that W bar squared as a geometric series. So typically in a biological model, we would suppose that selection is rather weak and that's what we see reflected in reality. It's not that my um, heterozygotes are doomed to die out immediately. We always do see our hybrid zones. So that suggests that selection is weak. And so we're going to take that s to be small and ignore terms of order s squared. So expanding this as a geometric series, what do we get? Well, we um, are not going to offend you by doing the calculation in public, uh, but if you expand this out and throw away the terms of order little s squared, you obtain this expression, this 1 minus s times w bar plus s times 3 w bar squared minus twice w bar cubed. That's just expanding it all out. But I want to express things as a change in allele frequencies between my um, pool of gametes from which the next generation will be sampled and my parental population. So I'm going to write that as W bar plus a remainder. Okay? So the change over a single generation that I expect to see in the frequency of little a's is going to be that expression on the right hand side. So that's S W bar 1 minus W bar twice W bar minus 1. Okay. Now that's only telling you what's happening over a single generation. And we're talking about the time since the last glacial maximum when we're talking about how these things are evolving. So um, let's try and actually develop a dynamical model for how the population, how the frequencies of the two different types of the population will evolve. So that was the expression that we just derived, which said the difference between my pool of gametes and the parental population. And if I suppose the population is infinite, which is something we'll throw away in due course, but let's suppose for now that the population is infinite, and that I can write S as something divided by M where M is very large. Well, then 
the number of generations over which I'm going to have to observe my population to see an appreciable change in frequencies is on the order of capital M. And so I'm going to measure time in units of capital M generations. And then I can, um, again, in slightly sloppy sort of notation, denote the ratio of the change in allele, in, in allele frequencies over a single generation. So that's like delta W bar divided by the intergeneration time, that's delta T, is going to look like alpha times this correction, this W bar, one minus W bar, twice W bar minus one, plus order S squared. And of course, this thing on the left is meant to be an approximation to the derivative. So if I let M tend to infinity, then I expect that I can approximate for a small selection coefficient and a large number of generations, the evolution of the allele frequencies in my population just by an ordinary differential equation. Okay, and there it is. And of course, we're interested in populations that are dispersed in space because we want to understand how the hybrid zone work, moves. And so we add a dispersal term to that. And that gives us this differential equation, which is actually an extremely famous differential equation. It's a, a special case of what's called the Allen-Kahn equation. Okay, so there's my Allen-Kahn equation. And here for fun is, is another hybrid zone. So not all hybrid zones are associated with plants. We also see them in, in animals. And here is the most famous hybrid zone of all time. It's in every textbook on evolution. It's the mouse hybrid zone. And what you can see is that it runs from um, Denmark and northern Germany uh, all the way down through Germany and right down to reach the coast just to the east of Trieste. And what you might notice about this hybrid zone is it's remarkably smooth and it's remarkably narrow. So this is the mouse hybrid zone. And on the right hand side, your house mice have one fur color. On the other side, on the left hand side, the west, um, we have Mus domesticus, that's the house mouse where I live, and the fur is a slightly different color. And in between we see hybrids. And that hybrid zone between the two is a remarkably smooth object. And what we're going to see is why it might take that shape. And I emphasize that there are other mechanisms that lead, lead to hybrid zones. It's not just selection against heterozygotes, um, but Mus musculus mus domesticus is like our antirhinum, another example where we believe it's maintained through a selection against heterozygotes. And what we're going to do is investigate, based on this Allen Kahn equation, how we should expect a hybrid zone to evolve if the hybrid zone is being maintained because of this selection, because of this genetic uh, mechanism, which is a selection against uh, mice of mixed ancestry. And I emphasize the width of the zone is very narrow. And so, what I'd like really to do is to model it as though it were a single. Um, line, a one-dimensional object, so instead or a curve. So instead of using this Allen Kahn equation, what I'd like to do is zoom out so that the interface between where I see Mus domesticus on, on the left and Mus musculus on the right is really just a curve. Whereas if I model it with my Allen Kahn equation directly, what I'm going to see is something which has got a width, as I've put at the bottom of the, of the slide, of about the square root of twice m over alpha in those units. Okay. So what does zooming out mean? Well, zooming out means you know, looking over very long time scales from very far away. And that really means taking a diffusive scaling. And if I take a diffusive scaling and apply it to the Allen Kahn equation, then the Laplacian term doesn't change. But what happens is that the term in front of the nonlinearity gets inflated by the factor by which I'm speeding up time. And for convenience, we're going to set m equals 2 and alpha equals 1. Of course, that's deep inconvenience as a probabilist. I'd rather set m equals 1. But to compare to the differential equations literature, we're going to take that m is equal to 2. And what's known about this equation is that if I start from sufficiently regular initial conditions, as epsilon goes to 0, so as the strength of that nonlinearity goes to infinity, the solution is going to converge to, uh, at least for regular initial conditions, as I say, the indicator function of a region whose boundary evolves according to what's known as curvature flow. Now, I should emphasize now that in higher dimensions, we get something called mean curvature flow. All our results apply in higher dimensions, but two dimensions was where I was really interested. So I'll probably just say curvature flow, even when I mean mean curvature flow. So let me tell you what curvature flow does. So the technical definition is that I have a family of embeddings from the circle into R2. I write NT for the unit inward normal to the um, to gamma t, to my curve at the point u, and then I evolve that point at a rate that's proportional to the curvature, 
in the direction of that inward facing normal. Okay, but it's much nicer, isn't it, to see a picture? So here is a possible domain. Here's the boundary of the domain. And we're going to see how that, so that's my gamma t, and we're going to see how that might evolve with time. And the curvature, roughly speaking, is that I take the biggest circle that I can that just touches the curve at a point. So at this point, it would be this circle with the radius denoted by this red arrow. And the curvature would be one over the radius of that circle. So in particular, the curvature at this point is bigger than the curvature at this point where we have the larger circle. And notice also that at the first point, the point that moves faster, the, po the normal is pointing inwards. So the direction of the curvature flow is going to be into the domain. Whereas at the point which is moving more slowly, the arrow is pointing outwards, the direction in which that point moves is going to be towards the outside of the domain. So it's going to try and make this thing look a little bit more elliptical. And I have here a um, simulation and I have to do something incredibly clever. So again, we're at the mercy of my technical skills. So let me try for a different screen share. So this was a simulation done by a guy called Matt Dunlop when he was still a graduate student in the University of Warwick. And of course, it's not good for one's um, in intellectual image to ask a graduate student of a rival university to produce a video because they're likely to make you look a little bit unserious. So the starting point of our curvature flow is going to be the outside of the Batman symbol. And if you look in the top left of the screen, you'll see what he called the video. Um, just to make, just to completely destroy any credibility I might have. And this is what happens to the Batman video, the Batman symbol, when you evolve it according to curvature flow. So you see very rapidly, it evolves into something that's convex. It looks like a sausage. The bits on the top and on the bottom of this sausage are hardly moving at all because it's almost flat. The points at the end are moving in quite rapidly. And soon, it's the, even in the middle, the curvature is no longer flat. And things are going to start going faster and faster as it becomes asymptotically a circle, which will shrink to a point. So that's what curvature flow does in um, two dimensions. Right. So let's go back to, hopefully, oh, it's a miracle. Let's see how many slides I accidentally missed out. No? OK. So let's go back to the Alan Kahn equation and curvature flow, and I'll state a formal theorem for you. So what the formal theorem says is that if I start from a nice enough initial condition, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to suppose that the initial condition is such that on the inside of the region bounded by gamma zero, which is going to be the starting point for my curvature flow, the solution is less than a half on gamma zero, the starting point for my curvature flow, it's going to be equal to a half, and outside, it's going to be greater than a half. Okay. And then what's going to happen is that as this epsilon tends to zero, the motion of that level set where gamma is equal to a half, where w is equal to a half, is going to get closer and closer to evolving according to curvature flow. And the way to formulate that mathematically um, was done by Chen in 1992. Now my curvature flow is only fixed, only, only um, defined up to some fixed time capital T. That's when our Batman symbol, symbol went pop because my circle had shrunk to a point. So I'm only going to have a theorem up to some point before that point when the singularity develops. So let's in fix that. Alison. Alison. Yeah. Um, in fact, there is a question exactly about this. So does does the Batman becomes a point in finite time? Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. So any convex region which is um, uh, compact, I suppose, sorry, any bounded region in space is going to shrink to a point in finite time. And asymptotically, it will look like a circle, and then it goes really fast. Thank you. OK. So what, the, um, what Chen's theorem says is that at least if I allow the thing to settle down a bit, so I look at times after order epsilon squared mod log epsilon, and I stop before I'm at this, this time, which is strictly before the explosion time, then if I start outside, um, if I, so how do I put this? If my distance to the curvature flow, to a curve evolving to curvature flow, 
is more than epsilon mod log epsilon. So that means I'm more than epsilon mod log epsilon of, on to the outside of the boundary of that region where the boundary evolves according to curvature flow. Then the solution to my Allen Kahn equation is actually bigger than one minus epsilon to the k. And if I start on the inside, so that means the sign distance is negative, and I'm more than epsilon mod log epsilon from the actual curvature flow itself, then the solution is less than epsilon to the k. So that's just a formal way of saying that as epsilon goes to zero, the solution is converging to the indicator function of a region whose boundary evolves according to curvature flow. Okay, so that's a, that would tell us what would happen if populations were infinite. But in fact, populations aren't infinite, they're finite. And if we look at a hybrid zone for a finite population, that's going to mean that we're introducing some noise into the system. And so we can ask what happens to the Allen Kahn equation if we introduce some noise. And we know it's going to be an interesting question because Hira, Reiser, and Weber in 2012 had already examined what happened when you added um, some noise to a two dimensional curvature flow. Now, I have to say, they were interested in statistical physics, not biology. And so, first of all, rather than taking, whereas we're looking at allele frequencies which sit, which sit between zero and one, they were interested in um, spins sitting between negative one and positive one. So we have to transform our equation by taking v to be twice w minus one, and you'll see that sits between negative one and one. And then our Allen Kahn equation would become dv by dt is Laplacian v plus v minus v cubed. That's all that transformation does. And then they added to that a mollified space-time white noise. Now, they, obviously, they had to mollify it because um, uh, that's going to lead to something more interesting, as we'll see. So what they discovered was that if you remove the mollifier, then the solution just converges weakly to zero. So you lose all the structure of the partial differential equation. But if, in, if as you remove that mollifier, you simultaneously allow the strength of the noise to converge to zero, then you actually recover the deterministic equation. So if the noise isn't too big and you have it mollified, then you still see the structure of that um, differential equation sitting there. Now, unfortunately, the randomness that we see because of what we call random genetic drift, which is the randomness due to reproduction in a finite population, is not well modeled through additive white noise. So we can't simply call on Hira et al's result and say, well, at least if the noise isn't too strong, we're still going to see things evolving approximately according to curvature flow. We have to work a bit harder and work out what would happen for the sort of noise that we're interested in. So what we're going to talk about now is how we can add the noise that's appropriate for modeling the randomness in a finite population. And we're going to first of all do that without space. So let's go back to how we derived our Allen Kahn equation. So when we derived our Allen Kahn equation, we went through the process that a biological population goes through. We said, what's if our frequency of little a alleles in the parental population is W bar, what's the frequency of little a gametes in that pool of gametes from which the next generation will be sampled? And in an infinite population, we knew that the next generation would um, represent that pool of gametes exactly in its proportions. But in a finite population, we suppose that the two n gametes required to make a population of size n will actually just be sampled uniformly at random from that pool in which the frequency of little a alleles is w star. So if I write w hat for the proportion of type a, type little a alleles in the offspring population, well, that's going to be one over two n times the absolute number of such things. And the absolute number of little a alleles is just going to be binomial with two n trials and success probability w star. And so the expected change over a single generation, so the expected value of w hat minus w bar, is just going to be given by the difference between w star and w. So that's what this line here says. That's the um, expected value of w hat minus w bar is alpha over m times w bar, one minus w bar, twice w bar minus one. That's what we saw in our deterministic equation. But now there's going to be some variability in that. And what's the variability going to be? Well, the variance of a binomial is npq. So we get, when we look at the variance of the proportions, we're going to get one over twice n all squared because we're looking at variance. So that'll net us a one over two n times p times q, which if we throw away terms of order one over n times m will look like w bar one minus w bar. Because remember, 
m is very large, so the difference between w star and w bar is very small. So to a first approximation anyway, the variance of w bar is going to be 1 over 2n times w bar, 1 minus w bar. And so in the absence of space, we were trying to model the evolution of allele frequencies using a stochastic differential equation. And there it is, and it's just the right Fisher diffusion. Now we want to introduce space into that. And when we introduce space and we add dispersal, we find ourselves in difficulty because that stochastic partial differential equation in which I've added a Laplacian term to, to model the dispersal and I've replaced the Brownian motion by a space-time white noise only makes sense in one spatial dimension. So the first thing we're going to have to do is work out how we're going to model random genetic drift in higher dimensions. Okay, now enter the spatial lambda Fleming VO process. It's a bit of a mouthful, but no one's thought of a better name for it yet. And I'm going to begin by telling you how it works in the neutral case, and then we'll work out how to add the term corresponding to selection. So the neutral case, what we have is that instead of thinking of reproduction being modeled in discrete generations, we're going to model reproduction through events. And those events are going to fall on our space, which is RD, and they're going to fall in a homogeneous way. So they're going to fall as a rate that's homogeneous in time, but it's also homogeneous in space in the sense that each reproduction event is going to take place only in a region which I'm going to model by a ball. It doesn't have to be a ball, but it turns out to make very little difference if I take a ball or something more exotic. So we'll just take disks for R2. And the centers of those disks are going to fall in a way which is just spatially homogeneous. So I'm going to throw down disks of a random radius, which um, is going to be modeled according to some finite measure. I'm going to take the radii to be uniformly bounded uh, for technical reasons, as it turns out. Uh, but I want, the I want there to be some variance. I want that measure which tells me how big the regions are to have a variance at least. So I throw down these disks in a way which is homogeneous in space and time, just using a Poisson point process. So that's all that this says. And thankfully, Andrew already told us what a Poisson point process was, so I don't have to tell you. So just think of these disks as raining down on the plane in a way that is homogeneous in time and in space, and which, where they have some random radius. And if you prefer, you can just think of the radius of being fixed. And what happens is that when an event falls, and here's an event here, I've just thrown a disk down with center X and radius R. First, I pick a point uniformly at random from, from within the region, that's the point Z. And then I pick, well, normally I would take a complicated type space and I would pick a type according to the type there, but I just sample an individual and I say, is that individual of type little a or of type capital A? And so I'm going to take K to be a Bernoulli random variable, which is going to be type little a, so it's going to be a one, with probability w of t minus z, so that whatever the proportion of little a alleles was in the population at the point z immediately before the event, that tells me the probability I'm sampling a little a individual now. And otherwise, I've got to type capital A and k will be zero. And then everywhere in this region, I'm going to update my wty, which tells me the frequency of little a alleles at the point y at time t, and I update it by killing a proportion u of the population. So I scale everything down by one minus u and I add u times k. So what does that mean? That means that if the parent was type little a, then I replace a proportion of the population at every site in the ball, a proportion u of the population will be replaced by little a alleles. And if the parent was a type capital A, a proportion, little, a proportion U of the population at every point in the ball will be replaced by capital A alleles. Okay, so that's the neutral spatial lambda Fleming VO process. How are we going to modify it to introduce selection? And then I'll tell you why it's not a, it sounds a completely mad model and you wouldn't want to use it for a biological model, um, but I will tell you why it's not so unreasonable in a moment. But let's first see how we're going to introduce selection. So we'll have neutral events exactly as we just had them except the probability that an event is neutral is just going to be one minus s. So every time an event falls, I'm going to flip, flip a coin, which comes up um, selection with probability s. And if it's not a selective event, I do exactly what we just described on the previous transparency. If it's selective, 
then instead of sampling one parent, so remember what I did last time was I sampled the point Z and then I sampled a type from that point. And you can think of that as just sampling a, a type from the ball. Now I'm going to sample three individuals from the ball, each of whom could have been the parent. I'm going to call them potential parents. And I'm going to choose to reproduce according to the majority vote of those three. So if the majority of the three individuals that I sampled are type little a, then I'm going to only have little a offspring. And if the majority is type capital A, I'll have capital A offspring. And let's just see what that does at a selective event. So at a selective event, what that says is that this proportion of type little a individuals at a point within the ball will go from what it was before, from a w, to a w plus u times 1 minus w, with probability, well, the probability that I sample three individuals, all of the same, all of the same type and all of type little a, that's w cubed, or the majority of individuals, so two individuals type little a and one type capital A, and that's got probability 3w times 1 minus w squared. And otherwise, a proportion u of individuals in the ball will be replaced by type capital A, and so w, the proportion of little a individuals, goes down by a, um, a fraction u, so it goes from w to w minus u times w. So that happens if I sample either three capital A's, which has probability one minus w cubed, or two capital A's and one little a, which has probability three w times one minus w squared. Okay. So if I look at the change in the allele frequencies in the ball due to this kind of event, then it's going to be, um, what's it going to be? Well, it goes up by u times one minus w. This is where I'm regretting that life removed the possibility of my annotating my slides as I went along. Um, so we will try and use the mouse. So u is going to be um, multiplying the change, whether it goes up or down. So I've taken it outside the ball. During a neutral event, the expected change is zero, exactly as it was for Wright Fisher. So I'm only interested in selective events. And the expected change during a selective event, well, if I have three little a parent, potential parents, that's the probability w cubed, then my change is of magnitude u times 1 minus w, so that's that 1 minus w. If I have two little a and one capital A, my change is 1 minus w, so I have my 3w squared 1 minus w multiplied by 1 minus w, and that's this term. And then I've got to go down with some probability, well I go down by u times w, so here's my u outside again, and here's my w now sitting inside, with probability one minus w cubed, that was three capital A's, and three w one minus w, and this w squared is because I'm multiplying by w. And that simplifies to what we hoped it would simplify to if we wanted something that looked like the Allen Kahn equation. So I have u times s, that's coming out as a common multiplier, times w one minus w twice w minus one. So the expected change in allele frequencies over a single event is proportional to u times s, but it's also got this nonlinear term, which we saw in our Allen Kahn equation. Okay, so that gives us some hope that this kind of selection mechanism is doing the right thing for our hybrid zones. Okay, and in fact, the first scaling result, I'm not gonna go through in detail what all these parameters mean, but a modification of a result that Amandine Weber and Feng Yu have proved and kindly put my name on the paper, um, says that if I scale this model appropriately, and it's a zooming out exactly as we're wanting to do for our hybrid zone, so I apply a diffusive rescaling, and you have to take my word for it, but this corresponds to diffusive rescaling in the spatial lambda Fleming VO process, then in the limit we actually obtain the Allen Kahn equation. So we can scale this model and get the deterministic equation we first thought of. Okay. We can also in one dimension scale it in such a way that we recover the stochastic partial differential equation that we wrote down before, right? So this, um, Andreas, you should turn your video off if you're doing things like that. So, so this equation here has got the right Fisher noise that we'd expected before, and this is a space-time white noise, but as we said, this only makes sense in one dimension. But the spatial lambda Fleming, Fleming VO makes sense in any dimension. So we can imagine that if we step back a little bit from the limit, and look at a slightly pre-limiting version of the spatial lambda Fleming VO, it resembles the kind of genetic drift term that we want, plus the kind of selection term that we want, 
and it has the kind of dispersal that we want. So that's our justification for looking at this model when we're adding noise to um, our Allen Kahn equation. And what we're interested in knowing is, well, if we let the parameter rho, which is scaling the strength of the selection, so that's like letting this alpha here go to infinity in this special case, what happens in the limit as rho goes to infinity? So if we scale so that rho also goes to infinity, do we see something that looks like curvature flow? Or are we going to lose the, the structure from the differential equation because of the noise term? And here's another video. Um, now, we will see if this works. This is slightly less likely to work than what happened before. But with luck, this is a video that was produced by Nick Freeman. And here we go. It's a miracle. So what Nick did was he started from a kind of dumbbell shape at time zero. And now this shape is evolving not according to curvature flow, but according to this spatial lambda Fleming Vero process with selection of the sort um, that we just explained, which is selection against heterozygosity. And as you can see, it's happening very slowly because he took a very, very fine scaling here, but it is gradually becoming more and more like a um, convex object. And eventually I'm going to speed it up a bit because otherwise we'll run out of time. But if I get down here, you see it really is looking like a kind of fuzzy ellipse. It's going to go slowly because the noise will make little bits become concave and they get pushed out again and then the concave bits become convex and start getting pushed in but there are two competing forces but the overall force is in the direction of inwards and if I speed it again eventually it really does oh it's disappeared it really does look like a ball shrinking to a point okay so let's go back to our slides hopefully there we go uh, oh, I have to press one more button. There we are. And there's a result. And again, I'm not going to read out in detail what the result says, because I think it's slightly uninformative. Um, but really what it's saying is that as long as the strength of the noise, and the strength of the noise is determined by this, um, what we call impact parameter, which says how much the population is replaced in each um, reproduction event. As long as the strength of the noise goes to zero fast enough, as we zoom out as we um, uh, uh, allow the, how do I say this, as we, as we make things converge towards our deterministic differential equation, then things really do continue to look like the Allen Kahn equation. So this is an exact analog of Chen's result for the Allen Kahn equation, except that we have noise in our hypotheses. So except that we're working not with the Allen Kahn equation, but with the spatial lambda Fleming VO. Now, I think what's interesting about this result is not the result itself so much as the way in which it's proved, and that's really what I want to tell you about. And you might have hoped that we could prove it by taking Chen's result for the deterministic model and just tweaking it a bit. And unfortunately, that really wasn't the case. Chen's result was very, very rigid. And so what we had to do was produce a new result, a new proof, sorry, of the deterministic result. And I think that's where the interest comes in. And this is a result based on a stochastic representation of solutions to the Allen Kahn equation. So let's begin by explaining that stochastic representation. So this is a picture of a ternary branch in Brownian motion that I stole from uh, my student Ian Letter. He gave a pre presentation on it recently. So time is running this way, I guess, and he's drawn a one dimensional picture. And the idea is that each individual has an X, we started with a single individual at time zero, it has an exponentially di distributed lifetime, which in our model is going to have parameter one over epsilon squared. So it's going to be very short. And at the end of that lifetime, it produces exactly three offspring. And in each of these branching events, never steal a picture from your students because he's not got it right. In each of these branching points, there should be exactly three offspring being produced. So each offspring goes on to reproduce in exactly the same way as the parent, so each independently has an exponentially distributed lifetime with parameter one upon epsilon squared, during which it follow, follows a Brownian motion, and then it will leave behind at the location where it died, three offspring, and so on. So how's that gonna relate to the Allen Kahn equation? Well, what we did was we adapted an old idea of Delmasi, Ferrari, and Leibovitz, and we considered historical ternary branching Brownian motion. So we take that branching Brownian motion but we don't just think of the number of individuals in it at a given time, 
we really want to preserve this whole tree, this whole tree of paths. Okay. And what we do is that we allow, the, we allow that branching Brownian motion to evolve until time t, that's this time little t, and that's the time at which we're trying to solve our Allen Kahn equation. And our fixed function p here is going to be the initial condition for our Allen Kahn equation, and it takes values between 0 and 1. Now at time t, our ternary branching Brownian motion has some finite number of points in it, and I'm going to denote the locations of those points by wi of t. And at each such location, I'm going to I'm going to vote and I'm going to vote zero or I'm going to vote one. So the individual I is going to vote one with probability P evaluated at its location. So P of WI of T, otherwise it votes zero. And then what I do is I trace backwards down the tree and at each branch point, the vote of the parent particle is going to be the majority vote of the votes of its three children. Now, I'm going to show you a picture to explain how this works, but what it does is it defines an iterative voting procedure which runs inwards. So I start at the leaves of my ternary branching Brownian motion and I work back to the root and I'm going to write VP of W of T to be the vote associated with the root. So it's either going to be zero or one, but it's random. Okay. So here I can't draw branching Brownian motion, but I can draw the branches. So here are my individuals at time T hopefully you can see them. And let's start at the left here. So this, the first branch we see as we trace back is this one here, it's the highest one in my tree. Now the leaves corresponding to that voted 0, 0 and 1. And that means the majority is 0, and so this branch that subtends those leaves is going to vote 0. The next one across had votes 1, 0, 1, so the branch that subtends those leaves votes 1. Moving right across, the next branch I see is the one on the right. So I have leaves with a 1, a 0, and a 1. So their branch will vote 1. Um, in the middle of this branch, I have a 1 as a result of my first branching here. And then I've got two zeros inherited from the leaves, so the majority is 0. So finally, at the bottom, this bottom branch, I've got a vote of 0 from this left-hand branch, a vote of 0 from the middle, and a vote of one from the right. So the majority is zero, so the vote at the bottom is zero. Okay. So I've got a random vote, which was determined by those, the branching structure of my ternary tree and these votes, these random votes that my leaves took. Okay. And I claim that the probability that the vote at the root is one solves the Allen Kahn equation with the one on epsilon squared reflecting the branching rate in my ternary branching Brownian motion, and the p, which told me how my leaves would vote, being the initial condition for my Allen Kahn equation. And the way that you can justify this, this isn't rigorous, but you can justify it in exactly the same way as you would justify the duality between binary branching Brownian motion and the Fisher KPP equation. So just to remind you how that's done, you're just going to naively look at what happens at w at a time a little bit more than t, so at t plus delta t, I'm going to eventually subtract off w t x, divide by delta t, and let delta t tend to zero. So the way that I'm going to evaluate w at time t plus delta t, so that's a vote associated with the ternary branching Brownian motion that has run for a time interval t plus delta t, is I'm going to ask what happened to the ancestor of that ternary branching Brownian motion in the first delta t of time. Did it branch or did it not? So writing s for that first branch time, that's just saying is s less than or equal to delta t or is s greater than delta t? So this first line is just saying I'm going to partition on that event. Well, let's suppose that s is less than delta t. Then my original ancestor by time delta t has already branched into three offspring and they have been traveling for a time a little bit less than delta t, starting from wherever their ancestor was, according to Brownian motions. And although those Brownian motions are a little bit dependent, they've really not got very far in time delta t. So to a first approximation, they're still at the point x. Remember, I'm going to be dividing by delta t and just looking at terms of order delta t. And because the probability that s is less than or equal to delta t is already delta t, I only need to evaluate this conditional probability up to first order. 
And the, to first order, I can think of those three descendants of my original individual at time delta t still being at the point x. But now they're evolving independently. And so whether they're voting zero or one depends for each of them independently on the tree that evolves above them between time delta t and time t plus delta t. And because of time homogeneity of the law for my branching Brownian motion, that's the same as if I'd started at time zero and run until time t. So actually what I've really got is three independent copies of the vote at time t started from the point x. Okay? And so the probability that I'm getting a one is going to be that w cubed, the probability of the vote was one cubed, because everything's independent, plus three w squared, one minus w. So that's what this term corresponds to. Okay. So now substituting that and just rearranging, so this is corresponding to the branch having already taken place before time delta t. If the branch hasn't taken place before time delta t, then I've still got a single ancestor at time delta t, and that ancestor has just been following Brownian motion. And so I'm going to end up with a term that just looks like the probability that an individual started from wherever my Brownian motion is at time delta t is going to vote one. And the tree subtended again is running over the time interval between delta t and t plus delta t. So this expression is just the probability that my vote is one if I start from the position of my Brownian motion at time delta t. And so substituting and rearranging, I'm going to get this term, which will simplify to be just my Allen Kahn term, plus this limit. Well, but then this external expectation here is just with respect to Brownian motion. So this is really just the Laplacian applied to W. So modulo believing that things are regular enough for that calculation to work out, you can see that I've related the vote to a um, solution of the Allen Kahn equation. Okay. And once you've done that, so that was the equation. So remember, we're going to try and find a probabilistic proof that the solution to this equation as epsilon goes to zero converges to something that looks like the indicator function of a region whose boundary evolves according to the curvature flow. And translating that statement, or rather Chen's um, statement of that, into a statement about voting systems just says that the probability that I vote one if I'm a distance at least epsilon mod epsilon log mod log epsilon from the from the um, boundary of the region is bigger than one minus epsilon to the k, and the probability I vote one if I'm inside the region by a distance at least epsilon mod log epsilon is less than epsilon to the k. And what this representation allows us to do is reduce things into two steps. The first is reduces everything to a one-dimensional analog where I just take my initial condition to be the indicator function that x is big and equal to zero. And then actually the proof becomes very simple because there's a huge amount of symmetry at our disposal and deciding whether I vote one or whether I vote zero can be reduced to exploiting that symmetry and a statement about amplification of bias. So what do I mean by amplification of bias? Well, if P of x is less than a half, let's say, then the probability if I take three independent copies of that vote and take the majority of the votes, the probability I get um, a zero is, is going to be, so try again. If the probability I vote one is less than a half, the probability that the majority of three votes is one is even more less than a half. So if I'm biased to vote zero and I go through a round of this voting, the result is going to be even more biased to vote zero. And if I'm taking a very rapid branching rate, which is what letting epsilon goes to zero does, that means I get lots and lots of branching in my ternary tree. That means I'm going to amplify any bias lots and lots. So I'm either going to be very, very close to always voting zero or very, very close to always voting one. And then the rest of the proof is a coupling of a two dimensional Brownian motion to a one dimensional Brownian motion, uh, which is actually an analog of some very uh, very old results which date back to the early 1990s, late 1980s, early 1990s, which are associated with, there's a very nice paper which says the heat equation um, evolves level sets according to curvature flow, and that's essentially what this says. So what we've done is we've reduced the proof of Chen's result to a one-dimensional statement and then a coupling of the distance between a two-dimensional Brownian motion and a surface that's evolving according to mean curvature flow and a one-dimensional Brownian motion. And this really parallels 
the deterministic approach of Chen, but in a way that is much, much more flexible. Okay, so that's interesting. One computer moved much faster than the other, and it wasn't the way around it should have been. Okay, so for stochastic hybrid zones, we essentially what that reduces to, so I'm not going to tell you the proof because I'm getting very close to the end of my time. What happens is that our ternary branching Brownian motion gets replaced by a process where we also have coalescence events. So not only do we have branching, so these branches are always branches into three, like the ones we saw in our ternary branching Brownian motion, but we're also going to see coalescence events. And this corresponds to when an event in the spatial lambda Fleming VO covers a number of lineages in my ternary branching Brownian motion. And that can either result in however many lineages are cover covered. In this picture, there were two, sorry, in this event, there were two lineages covered and one offspring produced. That's because the event was neutral. In this picture, two lineages were covered, but the event was selective and it produces three offspring. But then the voting is the same. So I again do majority voting, but now I have to tell you what I do at one of these coalescence events. And what happens is that the branches coming into the coalescence event inherit the type of whatever goes out of the other side. And if there are three lines going out of the other side, they inherit the type of the majority. Okay, So it's almost exactly as before. And perhaps not surprisingly, if the noise goes away, what happens is the coalescence events go away and we essentially reduce to the deterministic picture. So we get back curvature flow. Okay. So why do I think that's interesting? I think, and it's a rather old result, and I apologize for not presenting something more recent. It's not that we've stopped working in this area, because actually I think it's got a huge potential. And that's because these voting schemes are very, very flexible, and they actually allow you to use Galton Watson type trees to write down dual processes for a huge range of nonlinear um, reaction diffusion equations. And of particular biological importance, is one of this form. So I'll just mention this one. So what we assumed for the anti um and for writing down our model of hybrid zones was that the hybrid populations were equally fit. So the relative fitness of little a, little a, and capital A, capital A was both one. But if I take the little a, little a to be slightly fitter than the capital A, capital A, but both to be fitter than the heterozygote, the little a, capital A, then I get a hybrid nonlinearity. I get a mixture of the sort of nonlinearity that we just saw and a Fisher KPP type nonlinearity. And there are lots of ways I can represent the dual. It turns out to be convenient to use the fact that I can write W uh, plus one minus W equals one to represent this last term here as a cubic. And then I can put everything in terms of a ternary tree and that turns out to be convenient. So there's not a unique dual, there are lots of duals typically. Um, but there's a, a huge amount of flexibility. And with this particular one, Mitch Gooding, in his thesis in 2018, actually studied what happened when you take a very strong nonlinearity, but with a very small advantage to little a, little a. And what you can th get then is a limit which isn't just curvature flow, but a mixture of curvature flow and what you might call constant flow along the inward normal. And as I say, there are lots and lots of modifications along these lines. And just a, a final slide, so what are we doing at the moment? And I use the royal we, but mainly it's what Sarah Pennington doing at the moment. Um, we're very interested in the fluctuations in the position of the hybrid zone with the small noise. And in one dimension, uh, one can say things about that. And Mitch's thesis says something about that. Uh, we'd love to understand genealogy. So normally when you write down a uh, population genetics model, you ask how, if I sample individuals from the population, how are they related to one another? We'd love to really understand what the right model for relatedness here. You, you can read it off from our pictures, but it's not very informative. We, we need a more succinct explanation. Um, and a teaser for people who know about these things is that in the asymmetric case, one might expect that the fluctuations in two dimensions look like the KPZ fluctuations and go like t to the one third. Barton's actually thesis before 1979, thesis from 1978, but then a paper he published in 1979, has a heuristic, and it's certainly nothing more than a heuristic, but a heuristic which suggests that in two dimensions in the symmetric case, as you might expect, the fluctuations really do scale like t to the one quarter, but we have no idea how to prove that mathematically. And with that, I will stop, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Alison, for, the, for this very nice talk.
and for not having me interrupt you, um, <laughs> but finishing on time. Um, there are two questions on the chat. So Stephen Watson had a question. If you could raise your hand, if you still want to ask it, and hopefully I will see your raised hand. And yes, and unmute you. Um, here we go. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful talk. Uh, thank you. So my question was related to the role of uh, curvature. So you had specified this uh, Allen can equation yeah. on the flat Earth, Euclidean space. And I was wondering whether you had uh, looked at the uh, Riemannian manifold equivalent of that. Yeah, so you get the same. So let me um, in curvature. explain where the curvature comes from. Uh, because I wasn't allowed to write on my transparency, I was hoping I'd be able to... Oh, come on. Where's the whiteboard gone? <laughs> ah. um, maybe you need to unshare your screen to have access to the... I'm okay, sure. I'm going to stop the share and start a new share and see if I can start a whiteboard. Um, no, it's not letting me... Be and I blame life. Really? Life. But what I'll do instead is I'll go back to my picture of of a um. Ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. There is a picture back here. Eventually, here we go. So, what we're really doing is we're saying that inside the region, um, the probability is uh, less than half. So this corresponds to zero, and outside corresponds to one. And what happens with the curvature is that really it's reflecting, if I start a Brownian motion from just inside, we look over very small time intervals, if I start a Brownian motion from just inside here, the position I must start from in order for the probability to be outside of the region at a very small time to be exactly a half is a distance inside proportional to that time interval times the curvature. Right, because in in Euclidean space, the curve it's saying that the um, modulus of my process. So I'm looking at a uh, a sphere. Then the modulus of my process is a d-dimensional bessel. So I've got a drift d minus one over r, where r is the distance from this center here. And so if I want the probability of being outside and the probability of being inside to be the same, and that's going to be where I expect the boundary to have moved from and moved to in that very small interval of time because any point further in the bias will be amplified and any point further out the bias will be ampl amplified. Well, really the curvature is reflecting where my brown, how my brown emotion um, evolves relative to that point. I guess my so you point can do exactly the same thing on a Riemannian manifold. It's just okay. a- So it's a known result there that the, the singular limit geodesic mean curvature <coughs> flow. And I was gonna remark that the thing you pointed at the end where you had a driven mean curvature flow that, that's also something, I guess, which has been studied in the material science context, that, that singular limit with an asymmetric. Yeah, um, absolutely, um, absolutely. So very, very uh, interesting um, overlap, I like it. Yeah, we're, we're really quite interested in those things. And I came across a very nice thesis um, by Lazar, I think. Um, so with this, which, where, where he was looking at curvature flow and, and material science. Yeah. And yeah, I, I'd be very interested, actually, if you, felt like emailing me any really sure. cool references you know. No, I'd be happy to. I mean, the, the, the versions that I've looked at are higher order. I mean, there's fourth order versions of this, but they may not be too relevant to the models that you're uh, thinking of. Well, so, actually, so... case is not non-conservative. Although I'm a little bit wedded to biology, my students are a rebellious bunch. And, <laughs> um, so Ian Letter, whose um, picture I'd stolen, and Kim Becker, who's another student, are looking at higher order... Um, non-linearities at the moment and actually looking at these cool you can set up a cool example where you get two curvature flows for different so you get different interfaces developing and they flow into one another uh, so they're having a lot of fun with that and i think they'd really appreciate some references i'll be glad to write you i'll do that thank you thank you very much um so there was a question on the chat as well by karen haberman she's asking um in the branching brown and motion when you do the the voting if you replace the brown and motion by another diffusion would you then obtain the same allen can uh, equation with, with the Laplacian replaced by the generator of the, the other diffusion? Exactly, and that's um, also something else that uh, rebellious students are looking at. 
Um, so they're looking at what happens when you put in something which has a long range dispersal and trying to understand. So there are pathogens, so things like fungi have enormously long range dispersal. Can they also develop hybrid zones or not? Or will they be maintained? Okay. Yeah, good question, yeah. Great. Uh, are there other questions? If you want to raise your hand for, ah, there is one other question. So, Philippe, you're up. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, a bit of a naive question. Uh, were you ca are you capable to formulate some kind of a condition on the on the width of the hybrid zone? Because when you uh, like. Uh, when you showed uh, this image at the beginning, it was really striking how the the width was uh, was uh, approximately constant. And uh, were you capable, like in in dimension one, to find interpretations for this? Um, uh, I'm hoping one of my I bet Sarah's not listening because she will be able to tell you the answer exactly. It will fluctuate. So, of course, in the deterministic limit, you can formulate it, and it's square root of 2m over alpha. And in the perturbations we're looking at, it's not going to change from that very much. It's going to be a small perturbation of that. Um, but I don't have a rigorous mathematical formulation of it. Um, I'm trying to think how we would exactly formulate it. It's slightly complicated to formulate, so I suppose we would formulate in, in terms of um, integrating out the solution. But it's a good question. I, I would love to understand uh, the simulation that I showed you of Nick Freeman's much better. So that slowing down of the hybrid zone. I'd love to understand the hybrid zone with a bit more noise a lot better. We're, we kind of cheated. I've been a bit disingenuous in pretending this is a, a real result because the way that we passed to the limit, the noise disappeared extremely quickly. And it will be really interesting to understand if I pull back from that and I say, well, OK, let's actually look at the noisy system instead of saying, yes, in the limit, it still looks like um, Alan Kahn or still looks like curvature flow. Why don't we pull back a bit and really try and understand um, those fluctuations? And we haven't done enough on that. We've done a bit. We haven't done much. But it's a, it's a good question. Great. I th can't see any more hands raised. So let me, I think it's time for the wild applause. So let me unmute everyone and let's applaud Alison and thank her for this very nice talk. <laughs>